Good evening. I'm Bob Grijalva. I'm the <laughs> I guess you know who I am. <laughs> um, I think this, this is the first time in 27 years that I've been here that I'm doing something on stage here at Hill Auditorium without a tuning lever in my hand. <laughs> it's kind of odd. There's been a lot of interest generated about the restoration of the Gershwin piano and about the role of my department. I think that the results have somewhat spoken for themselves tonight. We, we really have a glorious piano on our hands here. I really think so. The, uh, the Steinway Model A3 that stands before us is one of those shining examples of the piano building art. There were three earlier versions of the Model A, all shorter than the A3, but they failed to satisfy in the way that the A3 does. George Gershwin's A3, or the long A as we call it, is the one most coveted by pianists and piano technicians for its design perfection. Sadly though, the long A was flawed in one respect only. It proved to be an example of such superb engineering that it eventually became a threat to the sales of the much revered Model B, what Steinway called its small concert grand. So unfortunately, this led to the A3's demise and eventual discontinuation in 1942. The beauty of its existence made this piano its own nemesis in the end. And the result is that the A3 is somewhat rare these days and the opportunity to restore one doesn't come about as often as we'd like. When Mark Gershwin and I were communicating about the piano's future, he made his wish known to me that his uncle's instrument ought to be made available for performances by the faculty and students. He understood the significance that a donation of this kind assumes. And he spoke of the role the piano could play in cementing the unique marriage of the U of M's scholarly resources with the Gershwin archives for the purpose of the critical edition. During the restoration process, I was invited to write a blog about the experience, starting with considerations of what it means to restore an historic piano for the purpose of making it a resource for students and faculty. It amounts to reaching back in history and performing a forensic exam of a piano, discovering its secrets, learning about what makes it unique, and preserving that uniqueness. Some of you actually might have seen in my blog, I've got photos of a number of signatures inside the piano by different craftsmen kind of hidden away, tucked away in places that are secret. It's kind of cool to, to stumble upon a new signature. <laughs> Mine's hidden somewhere and I'll never tell. <laughs> As you could appreciate, there are some sensitive decisions that take on an importance that one doesn't consider in an ordinary restoration. What to do with the keyboard and hammer action, for example. Somehow I couldn't reconcile in my heart throwing away the hammers and other action parts in a garbage can that were once the vehicle of expression for George Gershwin. So one of the earliest decisions was actually an easy one, and that was to hand fit a new keyboard and action into the piano for performance purposes. The original action and keyboard with George's DNA and his ivory keyboard, his ivory keys, uh, they're intact and they're to be preserved and put on display in the new edition of the Moore Building. Yet, whenever we wish, we could put it back in the piano again. It will play. Likewise, the exterior ebony finish is exactly as George Gershwin left it. We wanted to retain the look of a well-worn piano. Therefore, all the dings and the dents, the rubbed off edges of lacquer where he rested his forearms while he was composing at the piano, 
they're all there. We didn't find any cigarette burns, though, and I'm glad of that. <laughs> the soundboard, however, had to be replaced. Old age and a crack that went down the middle about the size of the Grand Canyon made that ne a necessity, and that meant also that a new pin block and strings would have to be installed. That's when I turned to my longtime partners at Piano Crafters in Plymouth, Michigan. And I'm glad they're here tonight. Patrick and Luann DeBelliso, along with their soundboard man, otherwise known as a bellyman, Paul Stasmazic, they've been our close collaborators for a number of historic piano projects on campus. And they are unquestionably the finest Steinway restoration experts in Michigan, no doubt about it. I felt confident they would be able, yes, absolutely. Yeah. I was absolutely confident they would be able to construct a perfect duplicate of the original soundboard. Patrick is fond of saying the devil is in the details, and they clearly got all the details right in this piano. It may be fair to wonder, when all of this is said and done, whether with a new soundboard and strings and action, this piano has retained its soul, its Gershwin-ness, if you will. The answer is actually twofold. First, I think it would be very hard to argue that a new board, that the new board doesn't sound better than the original, having been cracked and having lost its crown. I think it definitely sounds a lot better. <laughs> And I think we can all agree on that, even with what little we've heard tonight. The other part of the answer is that the real soul of a Steinway piano resides within the rim. Steinway's process for combining the inner and outer rims into a single continuous bent acoustic rim means that every piano takes on a personality of its own. The manner in which the glue dries the way in which the wooden laminations creep against each other and adjust to each other, the months-long seasoning process, these imbue in each rim its lasting character, its unique sound, its soul. The soundboard is the heart, which has been transplanted here in the finest detail but the rim has remained, and it leads that conversation with whatever soundboard it comes in contact with. Yet, during another waiting period after the new board was put in, the rim and that soundboard spoke to each other in an exchange we humans actually cannot perceive. The crowning process is a cooperation between that rim and that soundboard, where the rim eventually has the greater say, and the soundboard agrees to this new integration of woods. And that's the real beginning of the music making they will perform together. And so the character of this 1933 Long A remains, and my confidence is also my conviction. George Gershwin's Model A is one of those long A's that somehow turned out better than perfect. It possesses a certain magic. And it's not something necessarily quantifiable. It's just serendipity. If it makes you feel, when you're playing it, if it makes you feel like soaring because of its majesty, if it makes you want to weep because of the sweetness of its bell-like tone, I feel George would agree, and he would be soaring and weeping with us. He would claim this piano again for his own. In my blog, I mentioned that as a tone sculptor, I stand atop a pyramid of builders and technicians who, in their respective times, created the foundations of the piano that we know as George Gershwin's Model A3. Without all these people to hold me up, there would be no voice through which he could sing again. So to my partners at Piano Crafters and to the fantastic team that helped me at the School of Music, Theater, and Dance, Norman, Scott, and Garrett, I don't know if you're all here, I say thank you and thank you again. To Mark Gershwin and the entire Gershwin family for entrusting me with the vision to make this piano a performer again, 
I extend my most heartfelt gratitude. It's been a thrilling experience for me all the way to steer this effort. Were I asked or allowed, I would order up a special badge for this piano with the moniker, One in a Thousand. And I'd place it just in the right place where anyone playing it could see it. Hearing is believing. And tonight, I think we're all believers. Thank you.